Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it is Tuesday morning, June 28th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We've got several folks who are already on the stream. Let's see who we've got so far. Sally, Anna, Brian, good morning. Lyle, Norma, Laura, Derek, Jeevan from Hyderabad, India. Good to see you. We're also cross-posted onto the Near Churches page. Gail and Garrett are with us today. As always, if you have any questions or comments on either page, you can put it in the comment section there, and I will acknowledge it when I see it. So we are in our 12th video in this series on asking the question, answering the question, rather, why are there so many churches? Hey, Linda. Hey, Miss Sharon. Hey, Miss Louise. Good to see you. Why are there so many churches? And um, we've covered division, the earliest departures from the New Testament pattern, um, church organization, some of the history of Roman Catholicism. We've looked at a lot of different things, and I've wondered, uh, I, I think what I'm going to do is t today, Wednesday and Thursday, finish this up, finish up with, what would that be? Today's 12. That'd be like 14 videos on this particular subject. Um one of the things that I wanted to get to, and I actually forgot had forgotten about this, uh, yesterday I said, well, we're going to start looking at some things in the New Testament, and you know, how do we determine what's right, how do we determine what matters, things like this, but I had forgotten, I printed something off, and this is what I want to spend time with today, in, and this is a few weeks ago, making preparations for this series of videos, I found this article that basically is called... Um, I forget the I forget the exact number, but qu basically questions that Campbellite preachers can't answer, and uh, so I I printed that article off and I read it and I thought you know this is <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that we have so many churches. Um, it, it's like people and and listen, members of the church can be guilty of this too. People have no conception of letting go of self letting go of your beliefs in an attempt to just go back. Let's see what the New Testament says. All right, what did Jesus teach? What did his apostles teach? What can we find in the Word of God? So many people are stuck in the rut of their tradition, their belief, their practices, and they have no, they don't have any desire to question themselves and to put to the test, and the only way you can put to the test what you believe, spiritually speaking, is by going to the Word of God. There's no other way to put it to the test. But so many people, and, and I think this is, perhaps this is just part of human nature, we don't, we don't like to do that. You know, we don't like to examine ourselves. You know, it's just easy. It's just easier to, you know, to just go along, get along, leave everybody alone, don't ask any questions. You know, this is how I was raised. And, it, you know, hey, if it was good enough for my parents, it's good enough for me. I think it can be very hard to break out of that mentality, but that's, I think that's something that we have to do, um, and, and you know, you look at the New Testament teaching on tradition, what Jesus said about tradition, what the apostles wrote about tradition, and biblically speaking, hey, good morning, Deborah, yes, she says they don't want to question or be questioned, and you know, if I'm going to claim to be a Christian, I need to be careful that I'm not like that. I don't mind being asked questions at all. Uh, I encourage it. And, and and I think every Christian should be that way. We, we cannot fail at introspection, okay? Not just what we think, but why we think what we think, why we believe what we believe. The, you know, the how did you get to that conclusion, all right? Hey, Diana, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. So anyway, I stumbled across this article, and I thought, I read it, made some notes on it, and, and I did. I thought to myself as I was going through this thing, I was like... This is one of the reasons we have so many churches, because people have the, have the tendency to um, justify themselves without any pushback, and they don't want any pushback a lot of times. So I thought, hey, you know what, I'll print this off, and let's talk about it. So I'll, I'll read you the first paragraph, which is, it, the first couple of paragraphs kind of give you an indication as to where this individual is coming from. I don't know who wrote it. I don't care. You know, it doesn't really matter. But the content is out there. So here's the first two paragraphs. 
The religious sect known as the Church of Christ, and that's in quotes, has many peculiar and aberrant doctrines. Okay, the word aberrant, A-B-E-R-R-A-N-T, means departing from an extent departing from an accepted standard. So this individual in the first line or two of his paragraph is poisoning the well, which tells you his motivation, or her, again, whoever wrote this. Um, The Church of Christ has many peculiar and aberrant doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God. Okay, so let's, let's poison the well first. Let's not ask any questions. Let's just state as the case, he's basically saying, that they are teaching error. Um, It goes on to say, it is a most deceptive and dangerous cult. That's your second sentence. Their teaching of baptismal regeneration is an age-old heresy that has damned millions to hell. Um, That's, um, you know, the idea of baptismal generation is that the water saves you. Uh, That's a misrepresentation of, of what, let's just say, what I believe. But it's also a misrepresentation of what Scripture teaches. Nobody that I know, I've been preaching for 25 years, no sound gospel preacher will ever say, the water saves you. That's not true. So that's a, that's a uh, misconception, let's say, that a lot of people have. It's an, anyway, baptismal regeneration is an age-old heresy that has damned millions to hell and is still doing so today. The idea that they are the one true and restored church of Jesus Christ puts them in the same league as the Mormon and Roman Catholic churches. If you are a member of this quote, he says, quote-unquote, church, or have been influenced by its teachings, we challenge you to ask your preacher the questions that follow. And then, I like this little sentence, then get your King James Bible out. You know, guys, listen. <clears throat> it's been said before, if the King James was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. I get so sick of this discussion of the, the perfect King James Version. If you think you have any perfect translation that is without some type of difficulty. And that that's not a reflection on the inspiration of Scripture or the reliability of the English texts. I'm not saying that at all. But there so like there's this there's there are particular groups. Uh, there was one in Pensacola when I preached there that believe and they they like had bumper stickers on all their cars. You'd know they went to this particular church. Actually their building was right around the corner from my subdivision, probably less than a half a mile away. But they had these bumper stickers on that said, if it ain't King James, it ain't Bible. And that shows an astounding level of ignorance of the translation process and all of that. So anyway, hey, good morning, Miss Jean. Good to see you. So you get out your King James Bible now, open it up, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you the truth. And they reference John 16, 13. Of course, that's a misunderstanding. That's a failure to ask the question, "Who who is Jesus talking to? Here's the thing. If you have a question about the Bible and the Holy Spirit's guiding you into all truth, you shouldn't have a question about the Bible. You will never wonder what a passage means if the Holy Spirit guides you into truth because that verse says he will guide you into all truth. So, anyway. Hey, Miss Connie, good to see you. Deborah says, I was once told that if any version... I was once told that if I had any version but the King James Version under my roof, I was going to hell. Well, I've never been told that one. Um, (laughs) I've been told things, but I've never been told that one. I'll just, I'll stop there. So I want to dive into these questions a bit, answer them. And again, I I think this, this article illustrates one reason, among many, why we have so many churches. So, uh, uh, Tyler says, yeah, it's, it's like they don't understand the King James is a translation itself. You know, um, it, it worked from previous English translations, you know. It's not the first one in English, and it's certainly not the first. And, but people, you know, they have their minds made up about it, and, and the King James is perfect. Anyway, here are the questions for the Campbellites. That's, <laughs> that's the heading for the rest of this article. Question number one. According to the history of the, quote, Church of Christ, God used certain men to restore the New Testament church in the early 1800s. Uh, where was the New Testament church before then? Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 18. What happened to the church, and where was the truth it was responsible for preaching before God restored it? And this, this kind of goes hand in hand with that concept of apostolic, the, the false concept of apostolic succession. Can you trace your specific group 
through, a, through an unbroken line all the way back to the first century. I don't have to do that. Nobody has to do that. We have this principle in the New Testament that is called the seed principle. The seed is the Word of God, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. I like the way Mark renders this. I'm going to turn over to Mark chapter 4 uh, because Mark records it as Jesus telling the parable. And uh, let me get there. Okay, Mark 4 verse 3. A sower went out to sow. Well, we know what he's sowing. He's scattering seed. And then you get down to verse 13. Listen to this. He's explaining the parable of the sower. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. I don't have to have an unbroken chain that I can follow and document throughout history like they claim in Roman Catholicism with the popes and orthodoxy claims with their church. That's not how it works. Christians, hey, Miss Sheila, Christians are produced, are brought about, let's say, through the new birth. And Peter talks about this. You can read 1 Peter 1, verses 21 through 25. He says, You have been born again, not through corruptible seed, but through incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The incorruptible seed that you need to produce a New Testament Christian today is not a line of succession. It's not being able to trace yourself and your church leader back to Peter in Matthew 16, 18. You need the incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's the principle taught in the New Testament. So that, that's a misconception, and that's one reason there are so many churches is because that's what people try to do. They try to look through history, and they, they go from... Okay, Peter was the, let's just using Catholicism because this is what they do. Peter was the first pope. And then that succession was passed on to so and so, and then, then to somebody, and then, and then all the way down to the 21st century today. You find no concept of that in the teachings of Christ or the apostles. It is not there. But that's one reason there are so many churches, because some teach that that is what is necessary. When Scripture teaches all that's necessary is you need the seed. If you plant the pure seed, the incorruptible seed, you're going to only get Christians. You're not going to get what, what's, what's been referred to as hyphenated Christians, okay, who believe and practice and teach different things from the pages of the New Testament. Not everybody who goes to church is a Christian. We need to understand that. Uh, and that applies across the board. You know, just because you walk into a building that says, let's say, Church of Christ, doesn't make you a Christian. Number two... And, and, and here again shows a misconception, a complete misrepresentation of what's taught, both by the Lord's church and in Scripture. But here's question number two. If a, quote, Church of Christ, unquote, elder, if a Church of Christ elder refuses to baptize me, will I be lost until I can find one who will? Whoever taught that in order to be baptized properly, you have to be baptized by an elder in the Church of Christ? I have, you know, I've been preaching for 25 years. I've never taught that. I've never heard anybody teach that. And anybody that does teach that is absolutely incorrect. There's no scriptural precedent for the, um, for who does the baptizing. Um, someone sent me a question the other day asking, can a woman baptize somebody? And my response to that was a question. Are women subject to the Great Commission? Then yes, they can. Now, we might... We might iron out some details, let's say, in terms of like a public, let's say, a public assembly with men present. Okay, that would change my answer. But if my wife were, let's say, she was out in the workforce and she was, uh, she were to be working with some woman and they were studying together, she could teach her the gospel and baptize her into Christ. I wouldn't have to be there. No elder would have to be there. So, um, that's a, uh, now, that's the place to start. He says, do I need Jesus and a Campbellite preacher in order to be saved? Well, hold on. You just asked about an elder, so now why are you throwing a preacher in there? So, it's a misunderstanding. Um, it says that the Church of Christ preacher, let's see here. Okay, if I do need that, then Jesus isn't sufficient. The Holy Spirit's not sufficient. He says the Church of Christ preacher is necessary to salvation, for he is performing a saving act when he baptizes me. That's a, a, a complete misrepresentation and misunderstanding. It doesn't matter who baptizes you. You need to know why you're being baptized, what it's going to accomplish. You know, it remits your sins. It adds you to the body of Christ. Um, 
it, 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 it makes you a possession of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. Th- th- those are the qualifications for baptism, not the person putting you in the water. That, that doesn't matter whatsoever. Um, the third question, <laughs> and I've, I've actually heard this one before in different formatting, but here we go. If the water pipes broke and the baptistry was bone dry, would my salvation have to wait until the plumber showed up? No. Go to a creek. <laughs> you don't have to be baptized in a baptistry. There, there is baptistry. There is this, a, there's a small minority of people who believe that you have to be baptized in running water. They consider that living water. And so therefore you cannot be baptized in a, uh, let's say, a, well, let's say a, a swimming pool. But, you know, if you have a filtration system on your swimming pool, that water's moving. So that is living water technically this is why we have so many churches. People throughout the years have taught things that are incorrect, that are not in the Bible. And a lot of times people ask bad questions out of bad faith, such as these. Um, if I were to die, this is part of that same question. So no, you don't have to wait for a plumber. Go somewhere where you can be buried in water. If I were to die before then, before the plumber could show up and fix the pipes, would I go to hell? Well, that's a different question altogether. Um, well, what does the Lord say saves you? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I mean, you, that doesn't change regardless of the what-if scenarios you, you put on the subject of baptism. That doesn't change. If obedience to water baptism is the means of forgiveness of sins, then I would. And you know what? That's true. Intentions don't send you to heaven. If a person, let's say they've studied the gospel, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they, they've changed their life, they've repented of sin, but they've not yet been baptized, they're not yet a Christian, period. Their intention to become a Christian doesn't make them a Christian. Their desire to be baptized does not mean that they have been buried in water for their remission of sin. That doesn't intentions, well, it's like the old saying, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that's absolutely true. Um, okay, uh, I've never heard that a woman can baptize someone if a Christian man isn't around. And and <laughs> I've caught some blowback on that, um, because that's not something... We you know, A lot of times, like preachers, when we talk about the Great Commission, we talk in very general terms, because like you're standing in front of a congregation, and let's just say it's half men and half women. I'm a man, and so I speak from that perspective. But every Christian is subject to the Great Commission. You know, every Christian can reach out to someone with the gospel. Now, if it were to violate, let's say a woman was teaching uh, another woman, okay, like I said, my wife. Let's say if she were out in the workforce, and she had a another woman that she had been studying with, and that other woman wanted to be baptized. Again, I wouldn't have to be there. My wife is subject to the Great Commission just like I am. She could baptize her into Christ. You don't need witnesses. We, we've come up with some strange ideas in baptisms today, like, like you have to have witnesses. Why do we believe that? Um, Philip and the eunuch were alone together, and Philip baptized him. There, well, okay, if you do need witnesses, how many? Um... Do you have to raise your right hand? I've seen this one. The people will raise their right hand before they baptize somebody. Do you have to do that? Well, no. So we get hung up in these traditions that we've seen other people do, and it's not based on Scripture. It's not a bad thing. You don't. I mean, it's not a sin to raise your right hand. But do you have to raise your right hand? What if you're left-handed? Um. So. You know, and, and I, think that's a, I think that's something that people struggle with in any subject. Well, I've never heard that before. Well, never having heard it before doesn't make it wrong, you know. It's, it's, if it's based in Scripture, just because I've never heard it doesn't make it wrong. But um, good thought there. I'm, I'm glad you brought that out, Miss Carolyn. Um, yeah, amen on intentions. Yes, <laughs> Brian. Intentions don't save you. Obeying God does. Um. So we go from, what if the pipes are broken and do I have to wait for a plumber? Uh, if, so here's another, another question. I, I'm not going to do all these. Let's see, I've got... There are 13, but the way this person does this, 
He'll ask a question, and then he'll write an entire paragraph trying to defeat the question, which shows that he has a particular motivation here. If my past sins are forgiven when I am baptized in water, and that's what Scripture does teach. I mean, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remitting, for the remission of your sins. To remit means to send away. Baptism washes away your sins. Now, when you are baptized, you're raised to walk in newness of life, and so you start, as we say sometimes, you start with a clean slate. So, at the moment in baptism, all of the sins that you've committed have been remitted. They have been sent away. So, if my past sins are forgiven when I am baptized in water, and it is possible for me to lose my salvation, of course, some people deny that, then wouldn't my best chance of going to heaven be to drown in the baptistry? <laughs> Listen to that. Wouldn't my best chance of salvation be to drown in the baptistry? No. Because in baptism, you have to be raised to walk in newness of life. So, again, this is a complete misconception. Um, yeah, Deborah says, get in the water as soon as you can. And that's interesting when you read the New Testament. You don't see any hesitation in the baptisms. You know, many in the denominational world today have what they call baptismal Sunday. Let's say a, a denominational group, they'll take their kids to camp, and a bunch of kids will get saved at camp, quote. And then they'll come back the following week home, and they'll have Baptism Sunday that Sunday to show that these people were saved at camp. They, they were saved last week, but we're baptizing them today. And they're not baptizing them for the remission of sins. They're not baptizing them for salvation they're baptizing them to recognize them as a member of that particular denominational group. And let me tell you something. We as members of the church had better be able to distinguish between that practice and scriptural baptism, which is for the remission of sins and which adds you to the body of Christ, not a denominational group somewhere. It is not possible to be saved before you are baptized, scripturally speaking. But that's what most people in the denominational world practice. You're saved over here at the point of faith, and you're baptized because you were saved. The, the, the baptism is a picture of your salvation, and this baptism today on Sunday, baptismal Sunday, will add you to our body here. That is not scriptural. So, um, no, it, <laughs> drowning in the baptistry. I, you know, you've heard of holding people under until they quit bubbling. Well, you don't want to do that. You have to bury them and then raise them up to walk in newness of life. And that's taught both in Romans 6, 3, and 4, and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. And particularly Colossians 2 and verse 12, in terms of baptism, it's a display of our faith in the operation of God. And again, you're raised up. You have to be raised up. So the, the again, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a foolish question. But let's think about this. Okay, so you are baptized. All of your past sins are washed away. So what then? Okay, what if you as a Christian then at that point sin? Well, just like with anything else along these lines, the Bible tells us about that. So you go to Acts chapter 8, and you read about Philip going down to the city of Samaria and preaching Christ unto them, and men and women were baptized, um, Acts 8 and verse 12. And then verse 13 singles out an individual. Okay, listen to Acts 8, 13. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Well, it's at that point that two apostles, Peter and John, are sent to Samaria so that those Samaritans could um, receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice that. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit until an apostle laid hands on them. That answers some other questions for us in the book of Acts. But anyway, Peter and John get there, and Simon sees that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He says, listen, I'll pay you for that power. Um, verse 20, Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, in the matter of the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the ability to pass it on. That's none of your business. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Listen, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. What is he told to do? This is a person who has been baptized into Christ like everybody else in Samaria, but now he's sinned because his heart wasn't right. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by the bitterness, 
poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. If a child of God who has been baptized into Christ, well, that being baptized into Christ makes you a child of God. Galatians 3.27 tells us that. What do you do when you sin? You repent and pray. You repent of that wickedness, whatever it is, and you pray to God for forgiveness. Um, you have to understand, too, the, the grace of God. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, talking to Christians. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us. And that word is progressive. Or I'm sorry, it's present tense. It keeps on cleansing us. It's ongoing. If we're walking in the light. Now listen, walking in the light is not the same thing as sinless perfection. You can be walking in the light and stumble into sin. And we have the privilege of the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleansing us from sin. 1 John 1 verse 7, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we do sin, we need to confess those things and we know that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't want to die in the baptistry. you got to be raised to walk in newness of life. And this idea that you can't lose your salvation... Well, we know that's not true. Most of your New Testament was written to people warning them, don't fall away. You know, if it were impossible for us to lose our salvation, okay, you, so you're baptized into Christ, you're saved, and then then what we, you know, sometimes refer to as once saved, always saved, if that were true, then just you need to get rid of the book of Hebrews. Don't ever read that book again. Because from beginning to end, that book is one long warning of do not fall away. Do not be deceived uh, rather, do not be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for instance. Hebrews 3 and verse 13. Okay? A couple of comments here. Uh, Sheila asks, if a couple are headed to get married and are killed, on a car, killed in a car accident, they did not die husband and wife. Excellent. Because, you know, a Christian is one who is married to Christ. Romans 7 verse 4. So if you aren't baptized before death, you are not saved. Derek morning, Derek, says Colossians 2.12, it's God performing the operation of salvation through one's obedience. God has always, and this is before the gospel, before the New Testament, God has always required obedience to his commands, always. David says, uh, for sure, baptism is not a silver bullet. I've known people in the past who are baptized and then fell away. Yeah, and like I said, we just went through that in Acts chapter 8 uh, with Simon and with most of your New Testament letters talks about this. Uh, good morning, Barry and Glenda. Barry says, people are to be taught before being baptized. Absolutely. Um, you need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, what it leads to, what the results are, all that stuff. So, anyway. if I, and So here's another question. Remember, these questions are for Campbellite preachers. If as a Christian I can fall away and, quote, lose my salvation... Is it possible to regain it? If so, how? We just went through that in Acts chapter 8, but that was the verse, or rather, that was the question following. And, and, and then he goes on to say, if God takes away my salvation, God doesn't take away your salvation. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. God offers salvation freely to all. And that's because he offers it freely because we have a free will. We can come to him or we can not. Um, when a person decides to turn away from God, that's not God taking away their salvation. That's them choosing to turn their back on God and walking away. Connie says, when I was baptized at age 12, I was so concerned about going to heaven. I was, I thought if I just run out in the road and get run over, I'll be in paradise until I learn. That would be a willful suicide. Yeah, that's. It, it's interesting some of the thoughts we can have sometimes and perhaps some of the struggles that we as Christians have with perhaps with this very subject. Well, what? I think sometimes we all struggle with assurance. When, when you do, read the book of 1 John. That, that book is a, that's an encouraging book when you struggle with the idea of the assurance of salvation. Um. It goes on with several questions, repetitive questions on, well, if I can lose my salvation, then what? Well, you can lose it, number one. 
And number two, you can regain it by repenting of your sin and praying to God for forgiveness. I mean, that's that's reiterated throughout the... That, that even comes out in the Old Testament. Like, read Psalm 32. Read Psalm 51 when David was struggling with his own sin. You can read about the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. You can regain, if you want to use that word, your, you can come back to God. But you have to come back to God on His terms, not on your own. Um, hmm. I think I may just spend one video on this. There's, there's so much repetition here. Uh, I tell you what, let's end here. I've already gone for 30 minutes. I'll come back to this tomorrow. I'll come back to this tomorrow. We'll finish it tomorrow, and then we'll finish up the series on Thursday. Listen, guys, I appreciate you being on here today. Had a lot of good interaction. I always appreciate that. Um, David says people don't lose their salvation. A better word is that they forfeit it by giving it away. I don't disagree with that. You can give up, can't you? Um, and that's in, that's on you, man. That's that's a choice that each individual has to make. Am I going to stay faithful or am I going to turn my back? It's like Jesus said in Luke 9, 62. Anyone having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom. Well, you put your hand to the plow. You made that choice. If you choose to look back, that's on you too. So, All right, guys, I appreciate you being here today. We'll pick this back up tomorrow. Again, you can still comment and ask questions once the live stream is over. So hope you have a good day, and I hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock Central.